Local programming on KRWG made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. Hello and welcome to Fronteras, a changing America. I'm Anthony Moreno. Thanks for joining us. Our guest today is doing research on nonviolent protests to the violence in Ciudad Juarez that has earned it the nickname the murder capital of the world. We are now joined by Daniel Esser of the School of International Service at American University in Washington, D.C. Daniel, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me, Anthony. I, in the intro, I talked about Juarez being um, dubbed the murder capital of the world. Right. That is not the case right now, is that true? Not anymore. It was for the last three years, um, but we now have at least two more cities uh, that are very violent, and in fact, if we believe the figure is more violent than Ciudad Juarez. Uh, one is actually in the United States, in Missouri. Um, uh, the other one is San Pedro Sula in uh, Honduras, and so I think it's very important um, that we acknowledge uh, that despite the extreme violence that we have seen in 2010, 2011, particularly in Ciudad Juarez, uh, there's now a downward trend. Okay. Um, tell us a little bit about your research. What was really the inspiration of going to Juarez? Well, I did earlier research in Kabul in Afghanistan and in Freetown in Sierra Leone. Uh, and I'm fascinated by what people do when they're facing extreme violence over a longer period of time. So not in one assault, but uh, for example, in the case of war. And uh, many people have argued, and I think rightly so, that Mexico is in a state of war. Of course, that is not something that the Mexican government necessarily uh, uh, wants to say publicly. Uh, but certainly, I think during uh, the Calderon government, uh, most of the states in Mexico really have been uh, have felt like uh, as if they were in a real blown, full blown out war. Um, so what I wanted to understand is I've seen how people reacted in Kabul, Afghanistan and in, in Freetown to this kind of prolonged violence and I wanted to see what happens when uh, there's a different kind of conflict. It's not a conflict between warring factions, it's not a conflict between an international invader uh, and, and local insurgent forces, but it's actually a conflict between the state and, uh, and a very powerful economically motivated uh, force uh, in, and of course, the shape of the drug cartels in Mexico. And I wanted to see how do people react in the city and, and do they run away, do they stay, and if they stay, is there anything that makes them act together and to bond or is it basically that they lock themselves up uh, and, and try to protect themselves by not being out in the open? So how exactly did you go about collecting uh, the data that you needed for this research? Well, uh, everyone who's been following the situation in Ciudad Juarez um, knows that there are these uh, stories of, of amazing cases of resilience and of people taking action, uh, choosing nonviolent means and really trying to do something about the situation, helping a particular group, helping people who are uh, at, at particularly high risk. Um, and I think these, these stories are very inspirational, very important, but what I wanted to do is uh, to get data on what, what average people do. So the, the typical person in Juarez, not the, um, the, 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 the highly motivated priest um, or the father of someone uh, who has been murdered due to a cause of mistaken identity and who then organizes uh, a sports team in order to both cope and also preserve the memory of, of his child. I wanted to see people who don't necessarily have a specific religious or economic or, or emotional motivation, what have they done? And so I felt that doing a survey uh, in the city was the most appropriate way of doing that. Um, what I did is I uh, looked at recent data collected by a team of researchers based in uh, Rio de Janeiro. Uh, and they have um, broken down the uh, murder, the locations of murders and homicides in Juarez during the past three years into the different um, sub-neighborhoods of the city, if you will. And so I chose four neighborhoods with very high uh, uh, murder incidents and uh, four neighborhoods with low, comparably low, still high, but for Juarez, low murder incidents. And I tried to understand uh, whether there are any differences between these eight neighborhoods in terms of how people reacted to the violence. Now, 
you collected uh, your data through z different zones. Right. And you, I noticed in your research that your zones were connected to each other. Exactly. So what I think is, is, is one of the fascinating aspects of, of this kind of uh, situation, but, and also hopefully the research that builds on it, is that uh, within Juarez we have uh, areas uh, with where, where we have clusters of homicides, if you will. And so there may be a couple of blocks where there are lots of homicides or have been a lot of, of homicides during the past uh, three years. And then uh, a few blocks away, it's a very quiet area. And so I'm really interested in uh, whether that makes a difference in how people react, whether they uh, look at purely their street or their block, or they look at the city as a whole. Because my concern is that certainly uh, in the way that Ciudad Juarez has been represented in the media, the, the image is always of the city as a whole. Um, and when I present this research, very often I get questions of uh, audience members saying, well, can I now go to Juarez? And my response is the response that every social scientist will probably give to a question like this, which is, it depends. Uh, it really depends on where you want to go. There's some very safe areas in Juarez, and there's some very unsafe areas still in Juarez. And, and I wanted to capture that in the data. Okay. Do you think be, we have that image because uh, the media kind of, of hypes up um, the violence, or if not the violence, these extraordinary tales of someone, you know, Com combating it non in a non-peaceful way? I would say, in, in all fairness to the media, they, they don't necessarily hype it up, but they select them. And I think it's understandable from the media's point of view to, that you want to select cases which really illustrate that. Because f numbers are cold. Uh, if, you, if you can't contextualize numbers, it's very difficult to tell a story. So I, I'm not blaming the media, but I think from the perspective of a, of a researcher, I think it's, it's my duty and also an opportunity to tell a more complex picture because I don't have to tell the story uh, in 20 seconds or one minute. Um, so um, I think statistics really matter but, but ultimately you will need faces for the story and I think the faces often lead to a situation that um, we think of an entire city of more than 1.3 million inhabitants in terms of a few stories or faces that we've heard or seen and I think um, as understandable and powerful that it is, I think uh, we need to be very mindful of the nuances that exist. Speaking of that city, when some people think of Ciudad Juarez, they may think of it as a transient city due to the, right. um, the maquiladores and things like that and the, the factories where people go. It's a worker city. Absolutely. Um, but your research that you found s so far uh, really kind of contradicts in some ways. That well, yeah, there are, some, there are some very transient areas of the city, but then there are places in the city uh, which uh, have had the same inhabitants for, in some cases, over 40 years. In fact, one of the areas I looked at and I just analyzed the data, um, the, the typical person living in this area actually has been staying there for over 20 years. So again, uh, I think it goes back to your earlier question about nuance and, and how do we see Ciudad Juarez. There's some, some very um, uh, fast moving places of the city, but then there are other places uh, which are, are really very similar uh, to its sister city across the border where people have been living for a long time. And so it's very important to, to factor in these uh, patterns of tenure, if you will, when you try to understand how people react because it has a direct effect on people's ability and capacity uh, to work together and, and to collaborate uh, when faced with extreme violence over a long period of time. Well, people uh, think of that violence and they may think that um, there is a powerful uh, drug lord um, that has a lot of control over a neighborhood right. or perhaps um, uh, another um, law enforcement entity or something like that. What did you find in your research so far when you talked with people who they said um, what what has the most powerful uh, impact or who has the most power in their community? Well, they see a certain power of the police, but what I found, which I think is maybe not surprising to those who've been following the situation of Juarez, but still very important, is that uh, the, the military, uh, the, the national army uh, that was sent into the city by the Calderon government uh, still wields significant power in the minds of people. When you drive through Juarez today, you don't see very many uh, military presence or trucks. 
Um, but I think particularly during the period when they were most prominent in the city, um, that has really, I think, uh, engraved itself into people's memories. And um, some units of the army uh, were welcomed, other units of the army have, uh, have um, engaged in abuse. Uh, and I think that is a very, that is a very vivid and violent memory uh, in, in the minds of the people. When people were victims of, say, uh, violence, did they turn to the police? Surprisingly, in, in many cases, they do. And I think that is one important uh, finding of that research. Uh, we, are, we tend to believe that uh, if the police is not trusted and if the police is even sometimes seen as the perpetrators, that that would completely drive the people away from the police. And whenever they uh, are being victimized, um, they would uh, turn to everyone but the police. But in fact, what we find, and again, there is substantial variation across the city, but certainly in the neighborhoods where people have been staying already for a long time, and as I said earlier, and in many cases over 20 years or 40 years or were even born there and are now retired and still live in the same house, there is a certain uh, ground level of trust um, that with the police that, that people um, ultimately find, I think, enough to uh, voice their complaints vis-a-vis -vis the police. And again, we, uh, in, in the team that I work with in Juarez, when we spoke with, uh, with dwellers in the different parts of, of, of the city, we didn't really hear a resounding rejection of the police. Um, I think what matters really is that there are seven different police districts in the city, uh, and the way that uh, members of the police force um, uh, conduct themselves and, and behave vis-a-vis -vis residents differs a lot, and that has a tremendous impact on the level of trust vis between the police and the residents. Do they have anything to do with perhaps how long someone has been a part of that community? Absolutely. Uh, what, what I find is that the longer people have been living in Juarez, the more likely they are to engage in neighborhood level collective action. They work uh, with other neighbors, uh, try to do something uh, about uh, the violence, either through protective means, by blockading a street, by cordoning off a street, or by uh, creating self-help groups. But they're also more likely to contact the police. Um, and uh, I haven't been able yet to tease out from the data why exactly we see this mechanism, but it's very clear that the most vulnerable, both to crime uh, of the more uh, uh, common kind and uh, uh, vulnerable to police abuse are the ones that arrive very recently that have no social networks. And if something happens to them, they also have no social networks that would allow them or encourage them to turn to state authorities. I see. We only have a couple minutes left, but briefly I was wondering if you could tell me about the political impact that um, is, is the case with what is, uh, do people vote for someone who is going to, who vows to combat the violence in Juarez. This is one of the most striking findings of my research. Uh, I um, expected people to be very, um, to have a very jaded uh, attitude towards politics. It turns out that they actually are still willing to embrace and support political candidates that make a strong statement against violence. Um, we gave them the option in one of the survey questions we asked, would you vote for someone who uh, promises to do something about the violence? Would you vote for someone who you know is related to the viola violence, the perpetrators of the violence, and you think that there may be some backroom dealings and that's why you think that person would be good as, as someone in local government? Or uh, would you try to vote for someone uh, who doesn't actually talk about violence and focuses on other issues? Or would you prefer not to vote? And to be honest with you, Anthony, my hunch was that most people would say, I, I wouldn't vote. Uh, I'm so, you know, I'm so jaded. I'm so, um, I feel so disenfranchised. I don't think politics can do anything for me. In fact, the overwhelming majority of the people we interviewed uh, actually said that they would vote for someone who makes a strong stance, takes a strong stance, and, and is very vocal against the violence. And uh, if that person has compelling uh, ideas uh, about what to do, uh, then that person will win the vote. And I think that is a very encouraging message, if you will. Because what we found as well is that um, overall the engagement of people who live in Juarez in political affairs is very low. And that's not surprising. If you look at the behavior of people who live in other highly violent cities, engagement and, and, and actively partaking in local politics really suffers under violent conditions. But the fact that people still 
think that there are political actors uh, which come or who come out of their own communities who can actually have a positive impact is, I think, a very good, a very good finding. Well, Daniel, thank you very much for uh, joining us and sharing this interesting uh, research that you have. I uh, wish you the best of luck thank as you, you uh, go on to uh, uh, conduct that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anthony. Our guest was Daniel Esser of the School of International Service at American University in Washington, D.C. We'll be right back. In this past election, the Latino vote came out in such strong numbers that it not only helped reelect President Obama, but it brought to the forefront issues facing Latinos in, on an everyday basis that gained the attention of parties on both sides of the aisle. We are now joined by Sarah Nolan, who is with CAFE, a, a faith-based community organization that has worked to organize the Get Out the Vote campaign in New Mexico during this past election. Sarah, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Tell us about your organization and how it uh, began to organize here in New Mexico. Yes, yeah, so uh, about four years ago in 2009, I um, was talking to a group of clergy and uh, we talked about how can we address some of the most deep-seated issues facing New Mexicans today in a much different way, uh, going beyond charity, beyond direct service, but saying what are we really called to do to get at the root causes of why um, we face uh, huge disparities when it comes to uh, the achievement gap uh, in, in school, to immigration, to jobs, all these things. Um, can, we, can we have a firm grasp on some of the solutions to, to get at the root of these problems? Um, and that was four years ago. And after talking with about 40 clergy in the southern part of the region, uh, a dozen decided, yes, we want to help start something different and address this in a different way. Um, I'm originally born and raised in southern New Mexico, a uh, Gadsden graduate, and so I have a deep uh, care and love for this community. Um, but also we bring together uh, a wide fabric of people that were born and raised here, new immigrants to this place, not only from other countries, but from other states like Wyoming and Montana and Missouri, um, and uh, call New Mexico home. And so we try to bring a, a wide multicultural group of people of faith that uh, really want to do something different in the community with one another, uh, with faith at its center. Uh, for this past election, when did you uh, really begin the Get Out the Vote campaign? Yeah, so this was a brand new um, task and mission for us. We had always been working on issues like health care and immigration and um, uh, foreclosures. But we said, you know, this isn't all that we can do. Um, a lot of our folks uh, say, you know, why vote? And what was the importance of that? And so we wanted to make a really clear connection with when you don't have health care, when you don't have quality housing, when you can't find a job, that's why your voice needs to be heard the most. And so uh, we actually started in the June primary um, as a tester. It's like, how much could we do uh, with the volunteers that we have and the staff that we have? And uh, in the June primary, we were able to touch 9,000 households with um, mostly volunteer. 80% of our work is done by volunteers. Um, and during the general election, we um, almost doubled that amount and we said we're going to try and touch 15,000 households in uh, southern New Mexico and um, and we made our goal with uh, with about 80 really committed volunteers from across southern New Mexico phone banking and door knocking um, but really saying can we make get out the vote first of all nonpartisan because we're a nonpartisan organization um, can we make it nonpartisan can we make it fun can we make it relational and not just transactional, like, hi, will you vote? Okay, thanks, bye. Um, but we wanted to really make a, a, a deeper connection with voters and, and people in our community. Tell me a little bit about your volunteers. Mm -hmm. um, anyone that has organized to get out the vote campaign or registered voters uh, knows it's not an easy task, especially when you're talking about the primaries right. in the uh, warm weather here in <laughs> southern New Mexico. Um, it, it, it can be a challenge. Right. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about um, uh, your volunteers and maybe um, you know how you made it fun yeah our volunteers were the best they were the best the June primary was was hard because it was hot and a lot of our volunteers and leadership came from our congregations um, churches that said you know I'm tired of the partisan 
the partisanship of politics. And I wanted, and, and I have a deep desire to get to the values of why I vote and why I get involved civically in my community. And we fit that niche perfectly because we're not asking people to go out and vote for a candidate or a person. We're telling them to vote for their community and represent their neighborhood, their, their city, when they go and cast their ballot um, and to vote their values. And um, our volunteers were predominantly from congregations. Uh, during the general, though, we had uh, we grew our tent. We were able to bring in a good number of NMSU students um, in. Our clergy pitched in and were doing phone banks. Um, our congregations gave a lot of leaders. And then the other really important piece was at that same time between the June primary and the general, deferred action was passed, um, and the Obama administration granted deferred action for uh, childhood arrivals of uh, undocumented immigrants. And so now they had access to work visas, work permits, and the ability to go to school. Um, and when that happened, um, a ton of dreamers, we had um, almost two dozen dreamers come to us and say, we want to help get out the vote because we want to secure our future. And we can't vote, but you can. And so can, will you vote, vote for me and vote for our, our dream um, together? And so we had a good contingent of dreamers as well turning out the vote for us. Tell us a little bit about the Dreamers, um, especially because with that act passing, um, the Dreamers, you know, like you said, organized and they, they had a big impact on this election. Could you tell us a little bit about them and for those who don't know exactly what right. a Dreamer is? Right. So Dreamers are um, those young Americans that came to this country um, undocumented, um, mostly when they were children, young children by their parents, um, that today are teenagers, um, high school students, college students. Um, already parents of their own and um, and are undocumented and have no path to citizenship and yet have a deep desire to be part of this the, the fabric of our country um, and really in some cases don't even know any other country but the US uh, and so it's that population that um, there's about 20,000 in New Mexico and about 40,000 in our region so if you include El Paso West Texas and southern New Mexico there's about 40,000 in our region um, and so it's a whole population, a whole generation of young people that had no path of opportunity available to them. And now that they do, there was this deep motivation to talk to their neighbors and their family members about, um, I can't vote and, um, and we don't know how big the fight's gonna be. Regardless of who won the election, um, there was gonna be a fight about uh, immigration reform. It was just how big is the fight gonna be? And so they wanted to make sure that their voice was heard this election. Um, and we're part of a national network called PICO, People Improving Communities Through Organizing. And we um, collectively in 20 states touched 1 million families um, to get out the vote. And uh, the Dreamers in about 10 of our 20 states were really key in, in our election, our uh, civic engagement work. Well, it obviously had an impact. Um, it really showed on election night because uh, the next morning, everyone was talking about the impact that the Latino vote had and uh, the Dreamers had on this election, bringing uh, immigration reform to uh, the forefront. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, ha now both sides of the aisle seem to be talking about uh, willing to uh, pass immigration reform mm -hmm. and see it as an actual something that could happen. Um, where are we now as far as that goes yeah. in uh, passing immigration reform? I mean, talk about a 180, right? So um, as, as a Hispanic female um, with a mom that went to every election, my mom voted in every rink-a-dink election um, and would take me to the polling place. Um, the day after election day to hear about Latinos and Hispanics being talked about um, in, in a way that made us feel mainstream, that had never happened before, not in my, I mean, not in my lifetime, I had never heard about Latinos as Americans and as voters, as mainstream voters. And that brought me to tears the day after election day. I'm like, wow, we matter. And it gave me chills. I mean, it still gives me chills talking about it. And so now it's like, what are we gonna do with, with this responsibility? Um, I don't see it as, um, as something that happened by accident. I think it was something that was very intentional um, many, many communities, not just PICO, not just faith-based organizing, but many communities had the intention of turning out unlikely voters. 
And so that intentionality then produced a certain result. Um, and so now what are we going to do with the responsibility we have now as, as likely voters? Um, and so, so the what now is really important. So my job and the job of CAFE is to make sure that those new voters are now becoming civically engaged more beyond the ballot box. But are they going to school board meetings? Are they going to city council meetings? Are they going to go to the state legislature starting in January? Those are the important questions that, that are going to tell me, do we have what it takes to, to live up to this responsibility now? Well, it seems like uh, when it came to the Latino vote, New Mexico was really ahead of the curve. Right. Um, when you look at it on a national level, um, how big of an impact, uh, or I guess how big of a head of the curve was New Mexico when it came to uh, looking at the national scene? Eighty percent of Hispanics, almost eighty percent of Hispanics in New Mexico um, voted, um, voted for Obama. Um, but we had the most Hispanics in any election cast a ballot in New Mexico. So if you just look population-wise, the highest percentage ever. And that was really exciting. So there was some, some energy. And I think it was more than just immigration or deferred action, but it was about jobs. It was about, um, am I going to have health care? And my kid, is my kid going to have a quality education? I have a four-year-old. She's going to start kindergarten soon. And I'm like, oh, Lord, you know, uh, is the public education system going to support her the way it supported me? So, um, so I think a lot of it was motivating um, families like mine to the polls on election day. Um, I think we are ahead of the curve in, in terms of teaching America how to live in a multicultural community um, and, and do it effectively. 44% uh, of our state legislature is Hispanic. Um, I mean, compared that to Arizona that has about 20%. Uh, I mean, we can really demonstrate multiculturalism in a way that, um, that represents abundance versus scarcity. Well, this is obviously a very interesting topic, and we're going to see the, the impact of that vote um, as uh, this new uh, Congress comes into session as well, and even this lame duck session as well. Um, right. Sarah, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Anthony. Our guest was Sarah Nolan with CAFE, a faith-based organization here in New Mexico that organized a grand uh, effort, get out the vote effort here in New Mexico and as part of a, also a part of a national network in, here in the United States. I'm Anthony Moreno. Thank you for joining us for Fronteras, a Changing America.